All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of Open Hardware TV. Uh, we have an interesting uh, agenda for you today. And as we've done with uh, previous episodes of Open Hardware TV, we pre-record some of the content to improve the viewer experience. All of our panelists are here with us uh, today watching the, the pre-recorded content with you. Enter your questions in the, in the Q&A um, chat window. And over the course of the, after the end of the live stream, um, we will come back with a live Q&A with the panelists and uh, answer your questions and hopefully have a lively discussion. So uh, please fire off your questions uh, in the Q&A and uh, I hope you enjoy the content. Here comes the live stream. Well, hello, Open Hardware Groupies, and welcome back to Open Hardware TV. We took a short break during the summer. And now we're resuming production, starting with uh, today's episode seven. And in today's episode, I'll provide a brief overview of the Open Hardware Group ecosystem, and then we'll jump into the discussion of a couple of projects that use the embedded class four-stage core that we verified fully last, last December. These are two derivative projects that we'll be building on the RTL in that core. Uh, first up, we'll have uh, Davide Schiavone from the Open Hardware Group staff to provide a, an overview of the family of embedded class cores that we have. Um, and then specifically, Pascal Guido uh, from Dolphin Design will join and talk about the V2 tag of the E40P core that we validated last December. And then uh, we'll have Tarek Kurd from Huawei Technologies join and talk about the E41P variant uh, of that project that is underway uh, currently. And then we'll bring everybody back together at the end of the live stream to uh, have a Q&A session uh, with the attendees. So please, along the way, uh, load your questions up in the Q&A pane, and we will address them to the best of our abilities at the end of the live stream. So first up, Open Hardware Group. We're a, a nonprofit global organization uh, that is specifically structured to curate high quality production verified RTL IP for use in high volume production SOCs, where hardware and software uh, de designers and collaborators can contribute uh, to these projects in an open source collaborative development environment. And specifically, the projects that we are working on all fall within a, a family of open source RISC V cores called the Core 5 family. We have many developers and contributors from uh, North America, Europe, and Asia. And we're really focused on leveraging existing best practices and commercial tools to create high quality IP that you can count on for use in high volume production SOCs. We have a very large ecosystem over uh, close to 75 members and partners, uh, ranging from very large semiconductor companies and systems companies, uh, tools companies, software companies, hardware uh, organizations, software organizations, and both uh, across the board, big and, big and small uh, organizations. So it's quite a vibrant ecosystem and also quite a vibrant research ecosystem and university infrastructure with many partners and members uh, contributing from the academic side and leveraging the fact that this is commercial quality, industrial grade IP that they can also use in their research projects. Also supported by a, a strong partner ecosystem to help us curate these open source projects. The way that we're structured is through a series of working groups and task groups. And in particular, the technical working group where most of the, uh, all of the technical work is, is done has uh, four task groups, a course task group, a verification task group, a hardware task group and software task group. And these are very active. Today, we'll be hearing about projects that reside within the course task group. Uh, but we have many, many projects across the board, more than 50 inactive projects currently underway within the ecosystem. And uh, you're welcome to check us out on GitHub. If you just search for open hardware on GitHub, you'll open HW, you'll find all of the active projects that we have in place. The episode today will be focused on uh, two uh, project cores, our cores projects that we have underway in the ecosystem. Um, and Davide will talk further about the roadmap here, but the 
two projects in question are the E41P, which we, you can see towards the top right uh, of the uh, embedded core section, as well as the E40P V2 tag. And those are both building on the E40P uh, fully verified core that achieved RTL freeze milestone last December. So we're really excited about the fact that we're building a base of cores and then uh, variants and derivative projects that leverage that base. So with that, I'm going to invite in Davide to give us a, an overview of the embedded class cores uh, that we have in the Core 5 family. Davide, welcome to the episode. Thanks a lot, uh, Rick. Now we are going to talk about the Core 5 eFamily uh, class of uh, CPUs that we are developing at Open Hardware Group. I'm David Schiavone, I'm part of the Open Hardware Group staff. And uh, today we're going to talk about the embedded class CPUs that we are making. So the first core I am going to talk about is the CV32 E40P. It is actually the first project of the Open Hardware Group. And it started from uh, the RISC core donated by ATH Zurich. It's a four stage in order single issue core and it implements the baseline IMC extensions from RIS5, plus optionally the floating point and other uh, um, ISA extensions as the pulp ones developed at ATH that are making the core uh, energy efficient on um, edge computing applications. And those extensions include DSP, hardware loop, bit manipulation, custom extensions. The core actually implements machine mode cleaned and OBI interface for memory. And the first milestone we achieved is uh, RTL freeze uh, last year, 100% full code coverage on uh, verification. And the second project is actually uh, being described by Pascal in the next presentation, and it's going to be about design and verification of the missing uh, features that we haven't done yet during the first one and are the floating point and pulp custom extensions. As it is the first core that we actually fully verified, we are also using as a baseline for future activities. So for example, we are going to improve the design and verification of the missing uh, extensions of the core. So we are going to use the same code base, same, same GitHub repository, and every changes we are going to do must be logically equivalent to what we have done so far, such that the verification stays in place and it can be still trusted. And so the new updates will only apply to the missing features. And this project is actually what Pascal is going to talk about and is going to uh, take the core again to the TRL5, so full code coverage, but on other instruction set extensions. Whereas we also are using the core for other activities, more for uh, research and exploration, as Tariq will say later. And uh, these activities are, for example, exploring new ISAs, new interface, new um, computer architectures inside. And therefore, we actually uh, fork the core. We do new activities on there. And the reason why we are using the same baseline is because we trust a verified IP and we are more comfortable in making changes. The core is also used in, um, in an MCU. We are developing the Core 5 MCU based on the Palpissimo platform, again, from ATH Zurich. It, it also contains an FPGA fabric from QuickLogic. And uh, we, are, uh, we are actually taking to silicons the chip in uh, 22 FDX in the next month. Another core we are actually building right now and also aiming for uh, industrial ready uh, TRL is the E40X. It has also four stage um, uh, pipelines in order, single issues, and it also has a PMA and a bus error infrastructure to be, uh, let's say, uh, more secure on memory transactions. In addition, it has an X interface that is called Core5XIF that is co-developed in the Cordas group and Open Hardware group that is making the core agnostic of any uh, custom extension. So the X interface allows the core to offload all the illegal instructions that are recognized inside to a coprocessor. And if the coprocessor actually knows these instructions, they, it executes it and communicates back the result to the X, X interface. The X interface together with the core are still under development. 
and uh, and under verification, of course. And uh, what we are going to to do is actually integrating this interface to the core and maintaining the whole code uh, base and leaving to others the developing of their own custom extensions with their own coprocessor. Also based on a similar uh, RTL uh, code structure is the E4TS. This code is actually meant for security applications. It has custom extensions for security as the, uh, to reduce, for example, side channel attacks. And also as in addition to the um, bus errors, it has a PMP and a user mode uh, re compliant with RISC-5 to split applications from uh, machine and user modes. And uh, last but not least, we have a two-stage, uh, really small core uh, targets uh, controller the application. It's the CV32 E20. It has also the possibility to implement the E extensions for register files. And we are going to start from the uh, low uh, risk IBEX RTL. And the first thing we are going to do is cleaning up the parameters such that we only maintain and uh, verify the one of our uh, members' interest. Plus, we are going to build around the core a core complex that includes uh, uh, a number AHB bus interface, a platform level interrupt controller, debug unit, and so on. So thanks a lot for listening. And uh, now back to Rick again. Very good. Thank you, Davide. Uh, please uh, stay with us uh, for the Q&A session at the end of the live stream. Now we're going to transition over to hear from uh, Pascal from Dolphin Design, and he'll uh, provide an overview and the motivations behind uh, the E40P V2 tag project. Welcome to the episode, Pascal. Thank you, Rick. So I am Pascal Guido from Dolphin Design. I'm going to present you um, the motivation of uh, Dolphin Design of using uh, Open Hardware Group Core. So starting from the CV32E40P V1, which is an industrial grade verified core, we are going to add new instructions to improve it and make a V2 with all these new instructions. So it's hardware loops, multiply and accumulate, post increment low store, and SIMD instruction at 16 and 8 bit level. On top of that, we are also offering uh, optional seamless precision floating point support, which is a risk of 5 f extension. The motivation, the second motivation for the Dolphin design is to offer an embedded microcontroller in monocore and multicore platforms for IoT and edge computing. And this embedded microcontroller is license free and industrially grade verified like V1 was. This microcontroller will, will embed DSP light capabilities, higher performances, higher energy efficiency, and smaller code size compared to V1. The other motivation for Dolphin design is also to be able to customize this core for specific customer purpose. So using uh, the capability of uh, risk of 5 ASI to customize and new instruction for uh, neural networks, complex number mathematics, or trigonometric function. And the list is not exhaustive at all. The road to LPL freeze, which is a TRL5 in uh, Open Hardware Group classification, is uh, using for, for, for verification the Open Hardware Group uh, Core v Verif environment, which is based on a new EVM bench, based on a reference model from Imperas with step and compare feature, and also based on Google Risk 5 DV test generation. Apart from that, we are going also to use formal verification of the instruction set architecture using one spin tools. The software uh, tool chain used for uh, this verification uh, is the one from Ambecosm, and all those uh, tools will be augmented with a new instruction for the V2. This concludes my presentation. Thanks for attending, and uh, back to you, Rick. Great, thank you, Pascal. Stay with us for the Q&A at the end, please. And our last presenter is uh, Tarek Kurd from Huawei Technologies. Tarek is a chair of the ZCE task group at RISC-V International and also leads this project, the E41P uh, project within 
the Open Hardware Group ecosystem. Tarek, welcome to the episode. Thanks, Rick. Hi, everyone. My name's Tarek. Um, I work for Huawei in the UK, and uh, I'm the project lead for the CV32 E41P core. So let me tell you some background behind it. What's the motivation behind the CV32 E41P, which I shall from now on call the E41P? Well, I have these, these two extensions, and what we want to do is basically to implement them and make them available. So let me just introduce them quickly. So the first one is ZCE, which is the code size reduction extension. It's currently under development. There is a stable release, V0.50.1. You can easily find it on GitHub if you search for RISC-V code size reduction. You shouldn't have any problem finding the release tag and the current version of the spec, of course. So what we found is that moving to RISC-V from other embedded architectures, the code size increases. And this is a problem, especially for embedded cores where you need your code to fit in a small external flash memory, for example. If you switch to a RISC-V core and the code no longer fits in the memory, then you need to buy a bigger flash and then your system cost is, is not competitive anymore, especially for IoT devices. So the purpose is to make it is to make the code size smaller and competitive. The other one is ZFNX, or frequently known as ZFINX. This one is sharing the floating point and integer register file. Again, this is very important for embedded applications which need floating point hardware. So it's currently in public review, ending 17th of September 2021. You can hopefully easily find the specification on GitHub. Search for RISC 5 ZFINX, uh, which has 1.0.0 RC. RC is release candidate. And um, so, a little bit of background. If you implement a floating point extension on RISC 5, you need to add at least an extra 32 32 bit registers, even if your architecture is an RV32E where you only have 16 integer registers. So, what ZFINX allows you to do is to not implement the register file and save a considerable amount of area, which is really, really important for small embedded cores. So why are we developing the CV32E41P? So we're trying to make use of uh, RISC-V International specifying ISO extensions and the open hardware group, building them and making them available to the community. So we can make these two extensions available to the community through reference designs, then this really helps adoption and this is good, good for everybody. So all RISC-V extensions require some kind of proof of concept. These are ISO extensions. And so we need to build an RTL proof of concept to check on, to check on the implementation, uh, check on the feasibility, check on the cost, and check that we, there aren't any unexpected gotchas. So why is Huawei doing this project? Well, again, it's to check on the RTL implementation feasibility, is to get ZCE promoted and supported by the open source community. And wider adoption means better tool chain support, which benefits everybody. So the, the E41P is based on the E40P, which is fully verified and available and supports the pulp version of ZFINX. Um, so it made sense to take this opportunity to move from the pulp version to the real frozen version at the same time, which should only be a minor change. But again, it means there's a, a reference design available for the frozen specification. And our plan for the E41P is only to verify it to TRL3, which is prototype level. There's no, well, currently we're not gonna go any further than that. So here's a block diagram of the E41P. It's a four stage in order single issue core. You can see the config string. So differences to the E40P are in bold. You have the option of ZCE and the ZFINX doesn't have the pulp prefix. As I already said, it starts with an E40P fork. 
So for Zfinks, all the tools are already available, not upstreamed yet, but now we have the frozen specification, we should be able to do that soon. And there are links to all the tools on GitHub and the URL is there, RISC-5 Zfinks. So ZCE, uh, Spike, Quemu and OVP Sim are available. So all three simulators. And um, we have the tool chain development ongoing, which I hopefully will get a usable tool chain in October, 2021. And uh, what's our verification strategy? Well, we're just going to write and run basic tests to check compliance, check the instructions are returning the correct values. We don't need to do full code coverage. We don't need to inject interrupts or uh, check the debug features. We're only doing a proof of concept. We would like to do some lockstep checking against OVP SIM, and we would like to do some basic random testing as well, but we don't need to. So what are the deliverables for the E41P? Well, we're going to deliver a Core 5 CPU with both of these extensions implemented. And after these extensions have been ratified by RISC-V International, then it's possible there'll be another follow-on project to verify them to TRL5, which is the fully verified production worthy uh, quality level. So thanks for listening to me, everyone. I hope it was interesting. And back over to you now, Rick. All right. Thank you very much, Tarek. Please stay with us for uh, the Q&A session, which is uh, coming up. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, thanks to our speakers for uh, for preparing that content. I'm getting a little blinded here, uh, even even though I've got my blind down. It's a bright sunny day uh, here in Ottawa. Uh, so sorry for that, everyone. Um, we had a bunch of questions come in already in the uh, chat window, which will in the Q and A window. Sorry, which we'll uh, begin to uh, answer here shortly. Uh, if uh, if you have any other questions, um, please uh, queue them up. We'll try to get to as many as we can. We'll respect everyone's time and not go past the top of the hour. Um, and uh, depending on how lively the, the, the discussion goes, and um, there's a there's a couple of questions that have come in that I'm going to kind of group together and and get both Tarek and um, and Pascal to comment on. It has more to do with um, you know what. What are you guys doing with these open source cores? Are you putting them in real products? Are, are the cores going to be made available? Um, so I'll answer part of the question um, from the standpoint that everything that we do in the open hardware ecosystem is available to everyone. Um, so if these projects are being worked on and collaborated on uh, you know, through our open engineering development process uh, within the open hardware ecosystem, the, the artifacts associated with that work is available to everyone. Now, obviously each individual organization and company chooses how they participate um, and, and what they contribute, but this is, this is truly open source, right? So there's no, there are no licensing fees. The work product of these open and collaborative projects are available to everyone. Uh, so, um, that answers maybe part of the question, but maybe we'll start. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll start with you, Tarek, and then I'll go to you, Pascal. Uh, so there's sort of a generic question of, oh wow, is is Huawei using RISC five in future future projects? And you can choose to answer that however you see fit. <laughs> can you hear me? Um, yeah, I, yes, uh, we already ship many RISC five cores every year, um, uh, internally designed ones. Um, we don't use, we don't ship any open source cores and we're not planning to use the 41P directly, but we will use it as a reference design. And it's, it's there to help seed the ecosystem to get the, get the support better for those, for those extensions. But yes, we're, okay. we're a big supporter of RISC-V and we, we ship millions of RISC-V cores every year. And is, um, the E41P, like obviously, as we're going to TRL3, and what that means for everyone is uh, it's, it's a research platform, right? It's a proof of concept implementation. Uh, we will likely have a follow on project that takes it to TRL5, which is, you know, 
proven hardened IP, if you will, fully verified and, and ready for use in high volume production SOCs. Is that a consideration for you guys down the road or you still think you'll be you know, just using them as reference designs and, and then morphing that into your own internal designs? Probably what you just said, probably uses has reference designs. Although there are other projects happening which will implement ZCE such as the E40X. Yeah. So that could well be the first TRL5 verified version. So it right. will certainly go into um, a TRL5 verified uh, open hardware core, open hardware group core. The only question is which one gets there first, I think. Sure, sure, makes sense. Okay, uh, th thanks, Tarek. Um, Pascal, over to you. Uh, there was, uh, you probably saw the question in the chat windows around uh, you know, what's Dolphin doing with these cores and are you going to make the cores available? Are you building a product? What's adoption, uh, you know, uh, for, for both Tarek and Pascal, um, every open hardware TV episode we've ever had has included uh, questions around who's doing what with what and adoption. You know, there's very, there's obviously very strong interest in the ecosystem adoption trends. So that's, I think, where these questions are coming from. Pascal? Yeah, so as you said, Rick, uh, uh, the core is uh, still, uh, is, is uh, an open hardware group core and we are uh, helping to, uh, to um, finalize it. But um, in our uh, perspective, we are using, we will use it in, uh, in our own uh, platform, so monocore or multicore and then sell the platforms to customers. So right now we are more uh, focusing on uh, selling soft IP uh, platforms, integrating vSCore, so with the V2, V2 one. And uh, concerning the SEM, SEMMD, uh, it's not uh, the P extension because uh, right now it's, I think it's not, uh, still not uh, ratified. So it's the pulp uh, CMD uh, instructions, but um, re-encoded inside the X because today they are using uh, other uh, standard extension holes. So it's, we want to, to upstream everything concerning the V2. So uh, we will re-encode this instruction, all the pulp instruction to, uh, to, to, to be inside the X uh, extension of RISC-5 so, so that it will be totally compliant with RISC-5 at the end. Yeah, we'll come, we'll come back to the whole SIMD, P, there's even a vector uh, extension uh, question in there. So we'll, we'll, we'll come back to those um, uh, questions in a moment. Uh, maybe, maybe actually uh, before we go to that, we'll talk about, there's a question here around TRL5 and how, how big is, is a core when it gets to TRL5. Um, and David, I'll, I'll let you maybe uh, take that one because it's a roadmap uh, question uh, more, than, more than anything else. Uh, and other than, if you're not familiar with the TRL scale, it stands for Technology Readiness Level. And it's, uh, it's a fairly well uh, adopted definition. But um, yeah, so TRL-5, Technology Readiness Level, it's uh, specified by NASA originally and also adopted by the, um, the European Commission as a standard means of defining the state of a particular piece of technology and its applicability for uh, you know, broad deployment. Now, obviously, in NASA's case, that's for you know space deployment, uh, right from zero and one, where it's really, really fundamental research, all the way through to uh, you know ready for uh, for launch, right? Um, so, there, on our in our uh, roadmap slides and and a lot of the collateral in our GitHub repo, uh, there's definitions around how we have applied those terms. Uh, usage guidance, if you will, of how applied the technology readiness level terms to the core work that, that we do within the open hardware group. And, and fundamentally, other than correcting functionality and further verification, there's not a lot of change in size. But Davide, can you talk to some of the cores and where they are in terms of different TRL levels um, and, uh, and what that might mean code size in, in terms of gate count and so on? Davide? Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, you're on the air. Yeah. So uh, thanks for the question. Well, the difference between TRL3 and TRL5 uh, in terms of design is not that huge. 
uh, that means that a TLL3 core is already capable of, in our view, capable of running applications. So the data path controller uh, interrupts, debugs, features, register file, and all, and all the, let's say, uh, key um, modules that are uh, making the core are already there. So area-wise, so kilogate-wise, TRL3 and TRL5 are um, rule of thumb 95, 98% equivalent. Uh, what, it, what, what takes the TRL3 to TRL5 um, is the verification. So it's what is happening outside the core. And so it's, it's not included in the, in the core per se, which is stressing uh, all the corner case conditions so a TRL3 core is able, capable of running an application, but maybe a corner case um, scenarios may break the code. Whereas TRL5 should be capable of, uh, you know, handling every every of these things, which translates to hardware to uh, more uh, checks in the controller whether an interrupt arrives exactly at the same time or this other thing, how the core should behave. And this is adding only a few kilogates, usually it's some multiplexer and some flip flops here and there. In terms of percentage, it's really small. Thanks, Domine. And maybe you could just uh, give the attendees uh, an idea of how big is the E40P? Well, kilogates is, uh, is a number that I don't like, but I, I know we are obliged to use it to to remove the dependency on the technology, but uh, the kilogates includes both. Uh, let's say a technology um, free uh, area count, but also counts the technology efficiency. Uh, so the, in 22 nanometers, that's why I'm obliged to say the technology node, I'm saying the, the, the number is around with the FPU, uh, 100 kilogates with the FPU. Without the FPU is something like 60 to 70. If you go toward the uh, uh, larger technology nodes like 65, then the counts uh, goes lower and like uh, 50, something like that. Right, okay, thank you. Um, so I've got a, another question that came to me offline, uh, Tarek, it's for you. So a little, a little bit not, a little bit out of the blue, not in the list. Um, given that you're the chair at RISC V International for ZFINX and ZCE um, extension task groups uh, and project work, and you know, part of you know, something that's been in place with, with the RISC V Foundation back when I was running it is we always wanted to have um, you know, a, a proven implementation as part of the validation of an extension, uh, a, new, a new extension. Uh, before it could get ratified and accepted as a frozen spec. Um, and the E41P project is, is going to be that sort of proven hardware implementation, which is great. Uh, but the question was, uh, why, why this core? Like, why are we using, what was attractive about taking the E40P? It's been uh, RTL, you know, reached RTL free use milestone last year. Uh, what was attractive to you from just from an ease of implementation standpoint or whatever the attraction was to using that as a starting point for the E41 project? Um, it's, it seemed to make sense to start from a well-verified core. I mean, we thought about maybe using an internal core for the um, proof of concept, but then we wouldn't be able to release that externally. So it wouldn't be any use for the community. So um, looking at the open hardware group, so of course status, it seemed like it was the right place to start from. Um, as far as I'm aware, it's the only fully verified core that the open hardware group has. Is that right? Yeah, as far as I'm aware, it's the only fully verified, 100% coverage driven open source core that's available, period, that open hardware group or others. Uh, yeah. Someone can yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, but yes, <laughs> it's, it's the first of many uh, cores in the Core 5 roadmap. So yes, yes it is the only one that we've, we've finished. Um, with, you know, hopefully soon, soon more. Yeah, exactly. I and mean, it, it always makes sense to start from something clean and stable. So you, you know that um, you're not going to run into problems. Or if you do, it's some, if they're of your own making, the core itself is clean. It makes life much easier that way. Tool chain, language, uh, development approach, uh, any of those uh, factors 
or were they considerations for, for, for how that fits in with your own development flow at all? Or can you comment on that? Um, yeah, it's written in system Verilog. I think the coding style seems, uh, seems quite, quite good. So um, I think that makes the code sort of easy to read. Uh, we haven't got very far with the verification environment yet because um, we've only really started working on the project this week. So, right. um, but I think it looks very mature, certainly, and uh, very capable. But cool. I can't say any more than that because we haven't really started it properly. Yeah, don't worry, we'll have you back again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. No problem. Yeah. Okay, um, let's let's talk about uh, vector extension. There's there's been some. Uh, questions around, hey, uh, are we doing anything with the vector extension relative to the, uh, you know, the E4 cores? Um, uh, but in general, I think we can talk about the vector extension and the, and the work that's underway. So maybe, uh, Dominic, I'll throw that over to you. Um, and maybe you can talk about some of the work with uh, CVA6 and ARA and, and the overall roadmap uh, in the Core 5 family relative to the vector extension. And, and, and answer the question about the e E4 family. Yeah, I start first from the question. And uh, yeah, we know that there are people um, in the research ecosystem like uh, South Afton in um, UK, and they are actually also use our core as a baseline to the E4 TP core as a baseline for extending um, uh, the core with the VEC extension. So the RVV extensions, not the packet SIMD ones. Although uh, nothing in the uh, short-term pipeline uh, within Open Hardware Group. However, there are also uh, other universities I'm in contact with that are considering using the E4TP uh, as, uh, again, the CPU uh, that controls uh, the, a vector engine to, to, to be compliant with RISC V. Uh, the RIS-5 vector extensions were born uh, more for uh, application class um, uh, computing engine, so high-end servers, uh, that kind of um, uh, application um, regime, whereas the E4DP is more for uh, edge computing and really targeting ultra-low power application. Uh, we, what we have uh, within Open Hardware Group is in fact um, a coprocessor, which is, uh, we call it CVVEC, that implements the um, RIS-5 vector extensions for a 64-bit application class processor. I mean, for, uh, and we are using our CV application class, CVA6 uh, CPU to, to, as, a, as a core, and uh, this CVVEC uh, coprocessor to uh, actually implement the vector extensions. And that includes the vector register file, uh, the memory ports, uh, to, to, to allow how, a higher bandwidth and so on. And this is within a research project within ATH and uh, Poly Montreal. Uh, they are the, the co-developing this, um, this processor and this research project actually happens within Open Hardware Group. Good. Yeah, there's lots of interesting thing, uh, things going on in the ecosystem that um, we don't actually you know, participate in and drive. Uh, uh, and you know that's one of the benefits of having uh, high quality, well verified RTL. Uh, like I said during uh, during my talk, where the research community can take the E40P core, know that it's fairly stable, know that it's well supported with tool chain, and move um, uh, move that into their research environment and focus on the area that they want to work on. So as as Davide said, we, we're aware of a bunch of projects in academia that uh, are, are doing work with the vector extension uh, through some custom accelerators that attach to the embedded core, as well as the application class core work that we're doing between uh, Polytechnic Montreal here in Canada and ETH, Luca, Benini, Luca Benini's team in, in ETH Zurich. Um, so the, that, you know, we, that's very exciting for us and that's part of the reason for building out the ecosystem. Okay, uh, thanks Davide. Um, I'll uh, we'll throw it back to the sort of SIMD and P extension uh, discussion that uh, we sort of started on earlier um, because we've got a few questions for Pascal around the pulp extensions in particular. Um, for those of you that might not be aware, um, 
Luca and Frank's team at ETH, you know, done a lot of work um, with some original user-defined extensions while the RISC V ISA specs were still being developed. So a fair amount of that work was done before at ETH Zurich, before the RISC V ISA specs were ratified. In fact, well before uh, the ETH Zurich team has been as involved in implementing RISC V based cores pretty much as early as anyone uh, in the ecosystem. And as a result, the, the RISCI core has a very, you know, quite a few pulp of uh, the, their, their platform, PULP, uh, the research environment platform is, is called Pulp, PULP, Parallel Ultra Low Power uh, at ETH. And um, they implemented a number of Pulp extensions, some of which are being maintained and carried forward and verified in the V2 pl- uh, project that Pascal was talking about and moved into the uh, correct user-defined extension space. Now that that's been ratified and, and, and formally, you know, sort of locked, if you will, in the ISA. So there's a, there was some some overlap of reserved opcode space uh, in some of those extensions that uh, you know naturally occurred as as the specs were frozen, uh, the ISA specs at RISC-V I'm talking about now um, after the, some of these cores were implemented. So that's part of the work that we're doing, and um, the SIMD instructions in particular. There's some SIMD instructions in there that are pulp extensions that are interesting. They're supported by a number of different companies and being used. We're going to move those and ratify those um, in our uh, in the V2 project or verify those, I should say, in the V2, in the V2 project. Um, and that's where the SIMD functionality is coming from, not the the P extension per se right now. Um, so. Uh, a long-winded background before the question, but here comes uh, Pascal. Um, the can you comment on the utility of the pulp um, extensions uh, in the applications that you're trying to serve? So, how useful are they to you and, and the applications that you're trying to serve? That's sort of part one of the question, and maybe part two is: uh, Do you see a role or a, a variant in the E4 family? That would be interesting. That you know formally supports the P extension as it gets ratified, and, and so on. And so, just a sort of general comment on a the usefulness of the pulp extensions and how you uh, how you use them, and and what the roadmap might look like um, from your perspective. Desired roadmap might look like from your perspective. Um, today we we are using uh, this uh, CMD instruction to accelerate. Um, uh, a lot of uh, DSP uh, application and uh, neural network applications. So going going down to 16-bit and 8-bit uh, is really interesting because it, it allows to parallelize the work. Uh, right now, it's uh, our main uh, use of uh, these instructions. Um, uh, I, frankly, I did not have the, the time to, 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 to have a look to uh, all the instructions that uh, Andes proposed for the, the P extension. Uh, maybe for sure there are a lot of overlap. Maybe there are some interesting instructions, but um, in a, in a, the, the, the time frame, the timeline to uh, to integrate the P extension into uh, the the V two was not um, um, fitting our uh, roadmap uh, of our platform. So that's why we did not move to uh, we decided we did all together not to move to uh, to P for the V2. We, we considered it at one time with Davide and other people, but uh, the time frame was uh, was not uh, fine for us. So right right now, uh, that's why we stick to the pulp SMD, making them compatible uh, by moving them to X. And uh, who knows uh, in the future, uh, 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 E40. 42P, maybe it will be a, a P uh, extension compatible. Uh, we'll see in the future. I don't know. Uh, it's uh, all, all people so far, but not a group to decide about that. Right, very good. Davide or uh, Tarek, do, do you guys have any comments around SIMD and, and P extension and, and what, what you might like to see in the Core 5 roadmap? Maybe I can start just because then. That was the first I muted. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, on the roadmap, from an open outdoor perspective, we can see that we try to consider TRL5 only a frozen spec of the ISA. This has a simple implication. If you uh, freeze an RTL with a 
something lower than uh, night, uh, something lower than one, so 0 0.9 spec, there's a, a risk or a chance that the ISA gets improved or changed to, 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 to achieve the 1.0 version. And uh, what you will have in the future is an, an RTL5 fully verified uh, RTL core that implements a, no, a draft ISA that is not maintained by, uh, for example, by the compiler and the software community. Because what it's important for us is not just the RTL per se, but it's also the ecosystem around. So if you, if you have an RTL5 core, you also want to have an, an RTL5 compiler, or anyway, an industrial uh, compiler that is fully functional and maintained long term. Uh, this doesn't happen with a fully uh, with a draft ISA spec, which is the reason why we are moving the pulp extensions to the custom extensions. Is because in parallel with this activity, we have software projects within Open Arduino Group uh, that are uh, implementing the pulp extensions into uh, GCC and LLVM compilers, such that they can be pushed upstream and then maintained by the GNU, for example, community. And so the pulp extension will be long term maintained by the open source software community. Excellent. Thanks, Davide. Tarek, anything you want to add to that? Um, certainly, the tool chains can support earlier versions. So, for bit manipulation, for example, you can specify version 0 0.92 and 0 0.93, I think, in LLVM. But yeah, it's obviously better to implement a frozen spec because you can guarantee earlier versions will change most definitely. And we know that the ZCE spec will most definitely change before ratification. So um, in terms of the P extension, I think we're quite interested in that because it doesn't add the vector register file. So the area overhead is lower. So it would be interesting to see that in a core sometime. That extension has been around for some time. I think Andes have Yep. made at least one version of it on silicon but it would be it would be good to see that in an open hardware core as a as a reference design and again to help the tool chain work i think yeah it was uh that, again that was back in, in in my days at the risk five foundation and the andes team uh, had a great made a great contribution to the uh the p extension um as, a, as an isa contribution so it was uh it's very good um, and they're a, they're a strong contributor to the RISC-V ecosystem overall, the Andes team. All right, uh, we are approaching the top of the hour. We've got 10 minutes left. Um, we've exhausted the questions that have come in from the attendees. We, we might, uh, I might still put, put our panelists on, on the spot just because, you know, why not? We're here. Um, but uh, you, for the attendees that are still on the on the webinar here, um, take advantage of the fact that you got some RISC V experts uh, and processor designer experts uh, at your disposal if you have any questions for them. And um, I'll, I'd, I'd like to ask a question to both uh, Tarek and and Pascal. And this is more about. And I'll start with Pascal. Um, this is more about the philosophy behind open hardware IP and the potential use or not of that IP in your respective organizations, uh, because it's probably the number one question I get. You know, we, we, we're happy about open source software and everybody's cool with, you know, Linux and GCC and LLVM and this is all good. But, you know, as hardware companies, there's, there's quite naturally some reticence in, in some organizations around a number of factors in terms of uh, being able to use uh, and uh, rely on open source IP. And I, I know that there's ongoing and continued discussions in all of our member companies, as well as uh, other companies that are thinking about joining the open hardware ecosystem. So Pascal, I'm wondering if you'd be able to share without getting into too much detail to, you know, don't get anybody in trouble, uh, but uh, I wonder if you'd be able to share the, the nature and, and overall tone of the discussions that have happened inside Dolphin Design around, uh, you know, using, adopting, and contributing to open source hardware IP? Uh, yes, it's a good, a good question. Uh, in fact, um, all the, the question and the talk about uh, using open, open, uh, open source core is uh, about uh, verification 
and um, uh, what I say, uh, what I call industrial grade verification. So uh, in, in my past, I, uh, I worked in, uh, on processors and, uh, and uh, having uh, uh, zero or nearly no, no bugs found by a customer is really important. And uh, to have uh, this level of verification on the, on the V1 tag, uh, what, that, that, that's what uh, pushed uh, uh, all of us to, uh, to, to use this, uh, this, uh, this car. Because uh, as, you, as you said, I don't know about all the cars because there are a lot of open source cars when you have a look to the, the web, uh, the, the web list inside the uh, RIS file, there are uh, tons of uh, cores, but the very level of verification of them is uh, unknown, <laughs> I would say. And, and uh, that, that was uh, the why I pushed this and why we are finally uh, adopted uh, using this core. And then uh, also um, to, uh, to have the possibility to participate to the V2 effort and uh, and, and then to, uh, to improve, uh, as I said, uh, uh, things uh, for, uh, for an unbidded car. Very good. Thanks, Pascal. Tarek, can you, anything you can share around those conversations inside your organization? Um, not so much I can think of. I mean, we don't, um, we don't sell IP externally, certainly only, uh, only products typically. So, um, um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I have anything relevant to say to this one, I'm afraid. No, that's okay. That's, 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 that's more than fine. All right. Um, while there are no more questions that have come in, and unless on the panel, do you, any of you have a question that you think should have been asked that you'd like to sort of pose out there and either answer yourselves or pose to one of your fellow panelists um, in the remaining time? And you don't need to have one. You don't need to make anything up just because I've asked. If it's no, that's okay. And we'll, we'll be able to wrap up early and, and put, this, uh, put this, in, uh, this episode to, to rest. All right, well, thanks everyone for attending. Um, appreciate uh, your attention and your interest in the Open Hardware Group. Um, and also uh, we do this monthly and we will be announcing uh, the October Open Hardware TV episode uh, shortly. And we'll be focusing on the ZCE extension that we talked about a little bit today and uh, the work around platform uh, spec uh, profiles uh, that's happening inside the RISC-V uh, Foundation, inside RISC-V International. So stay tuned for that and uh, we'll see you next month. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.